Hey yo gamers, welcome back to another episode, the actual second episode of our Tech Scoop podcast. Just so you guys remember, I am John, you most likely know me as Duck of the Stars, and I'll let the other two introduce themselves again. And I'm Brian, or Ravo Sportsa. And I'm Luke, or Logic Bits. We're all happy to be back, and we're going to start with the, I guess, the elephant in the room today in terms of tech news, not quite getting into video games just yet. Take it away, Brian. All right. Thank you, John. So Apple had their annual Worldwide Developer Conference just not that long ago, featuring all sorts of new announcements from the usual new MacBooks to new updates to iOS and everything else to do with that but the big new announcement was apple's new ar vr headset they are marketing this thing as if this is going to completely change the game and potentially like not necessarily replace the iphone or the macbook but be something that can like serve as all of them if you've ever read the book ready player one their goal seems to be making this somewhat similar to the oasis that I would agree on. I, I had to actually look at the video today. I will admit, I did not watch the showcase when it first came out. I've kind of tuned out Apple, and I think a lot of us have. I know a lot of us have not, but uh, I digress. So, yeah, you're right in this. This actually really impressive headset has come out, but the caveat to it is that the headset costs a whopping three thousand four hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents which is outlandish even for apple you know which is known for its high uh, high price marks which as we know is a typical thing for apple and i mean looking at the specs of the headset itself we're looking at greater than 4k resolution in each eye I don't believe they shared specific uh, too much more specifics in relatively typical Apple fashion, but the marketing demonstration showed some possible use cases, including like displaying multiple movies with Disney Plus, or say watching multiple sports events. It's Apple. It's obvious that Apple intends this to be a device for all purposes, from watching sports to watching movies to gaming as well and seems to be part of their larger ambition into getting more into gaming in general anyway luke i think you had something yeah i was just going to add that um this apple headset is definitely sort of a continuation of um what apple is trying to do lately with sort of carving out their own uh market segment for things that are really difficult to compare just in terms of product to product alone so some people have made the comparison between like uh, their Vision Pro and other existing VR headsets. So like uh, MetaQuest, the new one that's coming out, MetaQuest 3. Um, and just looking at it, you know, just objectively based on price, it does seem sort of ludicrously expensive. But uh, what some of the people have brought up is that it's very difficult to consider this sort of uh, in the context of other systems when you also have features that you will never be able to see on any other VR headset. So like in the demo, they showed off the ability for you to look at your Mac, open your MacBook up, and then be able to extend the screen of your Mac immediately outwards, uh, right towards the field of vision uh, right in front of you. And so features like that, FaceTime also is another feature. Those kind of things are difficult to compare because they don't exist in any form and they will never exist most likely on other competitors especially given apple's nature of keeping their own features to themselves in pretty much all contexts certainly and i think one other thing to keep in mind is that apple of course is not like its competitors in it does not have a major hand in the gaming industry And a lot of these VR headsets that we see come out, like the uh, MetaQuest 3 and, of course, PlayStation VR 2, even thinking about the Valve Index, which is honestly the next most expensive VR headset that I can think of, their their main purpose is 
really for for gaming and apple seems to want to change that and I, i'm not sure how that's going to work because as far as vr technology goes it's prime audience for for pretty much all of its existence has been gamers and so bringing this you, you can't even say they're bringing it to a general market because it's going to be a very specific very small group of 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 techies that aren't really looking for a gaming device but also have the dedication to apple and the the money to drop on this on this device and as john touched on just now the the overall market for this headset will not be the general population and i think that's pretty obvious especially given it's a first generation unit it's possible that in time, maybe material costs will go down and thereby it will be more exp or more uh, cheap for the general audience. But as of now, Apple's intent is clearly not for, you know, the per every person down the street to own one of these. Aside from that, though, the only other real thing to note in regards to other Apple news. So as I touched on earlier, iOS 17 was announced with a whole host of new improvements. One of the like most minute ones, but will save so much time for any of y'all that use iOS, is the improved autocorrect. As we know, iOS autocorrect leaves a little bit to be desired, so any improvements there are definitely welcome. Furthermore, it's rumored that due to mounting EU pressure on Apple, sideloading support which is the ability to install an app from a source other than the App Store, may be coming to iOS soon, which if that is true, that would be absolutely huge for really everyone on iOS. The last bit of Apple news, though, is... So, some context needs to be established first. A while back, Valve, the owners of Steam developed a tool called Proton to run at essentially games designed for Windows on Linux. This was to make Linux gaming better in general and also prepare games to actually be able to run on their upcoming piece of hardware, the Valve Steam Deck. And it has largely been very successful with exception to a few e anti-cheat issues here and there. But Apple's essentially made their own version of this, which will theoretically work to translate Windows calls into stuff that will work on Mac OS, as well as convert it over architecture-wise, because the architecture of Mac of modern Macs are not the same as most modern PCs. So theoretically, this could allow developers to more easily port Windows games to Mac, which will be great for growing gaming on Mac OS. And uh, on that topic of gaming, I guess we'll get right into consoles. I, I know that it's probably what a lot of you here are looking forward to, um, although I, I do admit I have a pretty large PC fan base here. However, we're going to start with PlayStation, which honestly, last week, we, or not last week, a couple weeks ago now, we had a good amount to talk about with the PlayStation Showcase. And kind of unfortunately, the only thing going on with PlayStation right now is the fact that they have a new SSD, or one of their SSD developers has a new version out. And this is by WD Black, which has made PlayStation 5 compatible um, SSDs since the PS5 came out. And this time, their their newest version is a lot faster. It will have one terabyte, two terabyte, and four terabyte versions, which I think was previously unheard of. However, the four terabyte version costs $549.99, which is $50 more than the actual PlayStation itself costs. So this has caused a little bit of controversy online, but it's not really anything I heard of. Honestly, when we were researching topics to talk about for this podcast, I had to specifically look up PlayStation news in general. This was the only way I could find it. And that is kind of because Xbox has stolen the spotlight even in terms of uh, storage. One other small piece of PlayStation news that John did not touch on is that Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is getting a port to PC, so that's exciting for our Steam users. But anyway, as John said, let's switch it over to Xbox. So, 
Xbox, we touched on this quite a bit in the past podcast, but the Xbox expandable storage option at launch for the series consoles was not great. Only one company, Seagate, made them, and they were often, well, not, not they were overpriced compared to similar SSDs offered for PS5 at the time. Luckily, a new manufacturer has announced that they're going to make official ones with Microsoft, and they are, I believe the... 512 gigabyte one is ten dollars cheaper than the seagate equivalent and the other one is the equivalent price to it however because of their introduction into the market seagate has dropped their prices down to be the same as the new competitor so in general storage is cheaper for xbox gamers and uh, just to make sure that people know the company that is making these new expansion storage cards is Western Digital. So go ahead and take a look at that if you guys are interested. I know I've been wanting to to expand my Xbox Series X storage for the longest time now. And obviously games are nowadays, uh, it's more common than not that they're over 50 gigs. Some of the newer ones are over 100. So you need a lot of space. It only comes with one terabyte. Of course, that's gonna be a problem. Um, the one thing I will say that I don't like about Western Digital's cars is that it's ugly as hell, <laughs> to be straight up. Um, I don't like the design of it, but uh, as I'm sure Brian and Luke here will both tell me, it is to go on the back of the console, so it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a problem for most of you guys. Which is good for those of you that do care about console appearance. All right. But... Aside from that, as we know, the Xbox Showcase is coming up. We already said some of our expectations slash hopes for that in the last episode, so if you want to hear those, you should go back and check it out. It's on John's channel, just as this one is. But other than that, I think that about wraps us up on Xbox, unless either of you two have anything to add. No, I think that's about it. All right. Yeah, it's been a kind of a slow couple of weeks for video games, although Nintendo has gotten a lot of uh, press attention in these last couple of weeks. So let's talk about that. First off, Switch Online has added a few new games. I believe Kirby Tilt and Tumble was one of the big ones that people are excited about. However, I, I guess that being said, if you think about it, Kirby Tilt and Tumble, I, I believe that's the correct game, right? Am I... I gotta look this up, hold on. Yeah, Kirby Tilt and Double, a uh, Game Boy Color game, and I, I guess the fact that I have to look it up, being the, the, the resident Nintendo fanboy here, kind of shows how popular of a game it was, and I guess that kind of begs the question, why is Switch Online still so bad? I, I do want to say that they have improved significantly since, since I guess... You know, even when they started, but even in the last couple of years, there have been great improvements with the addition of Nintendo 64, Genesis, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance games. But that being said, still, we have yet to see anything like DS games, GameCube games, and Nintendo is, is fully aware that these can run on Switch. You know, they were able to port and remaster Xenoblade Chronicles, for example, a Wii game, and a pretty late and heavy Wii game. So, as, as to That's why... Super Mario Galaxy as well. Yes, Super Mario Galaxy. That one and obviously looked great on Switch. It ran just fine. Um, if, if you're a fan of replacing the Wiimote with Joy-Cons. I know a lot of people are. A lot of people aren't. It's whatever. Obviously, we've seen examples of them porting GameCube games in the past, but... Even with the one GameCube game I can think of, Super Mario Sunshine, that's not technically available anymore. I'm sure you can still find a copy of 3D All-Stars, but they made it physical only for a limited time. Or was it digital? It was offered digitally during that window, but for some reason the entire release was limited, and I still don't understand that decision. 
And see, this comes with the greater issue of Nintendo and its iron grip on older content. Take, for example, let's use GameCube again. Another piece of news that just came out, the Dolphin emulator was trying to port, of course, Dolphin to the Steam Deck. Or was it Steam in general? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Brian or Luke answer this one as I'm not too aware as to what they're exactly trying to do. Both Steam and the Steam Deck. Essentially, by putting it on Steam, it would have worked more integrated with the Steam Deck. You can currently use it on Steam Deck, but you have to get it without, not through Steam. So this would have just made it easier on end users. Sure. Okay, so in that case, they were going to put it on Steam, and Valve worked with Nintendo to take it down. Valve wanted to take a laissez-faire approach, or... Yes, they, they didn't want to touch Nintendo's uh, hot privacy or piracy issue. Not privacy, piracy. Yeah. Nintendo is huge on combating piracy. Of course, emulators is technically one of the or emulators are technically one of the ways you can you can pirate games. But you realistically it's yeah, okay. In Nintendo's defense, realistically, the vast majority of people using these emulators are using them to pirate it. But that also comes at the reason that Nintendo is not releasing their older games. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would love to play all of their GameCube games, their Nintendo 64 games that aren't released on the Nintendo Online uh, Expansion Pass. You, you know, all these games are, could be available but aren't, and so people are turning to emulators because they're too damn expensive to purchase for the average person. Um, and you can't get them on the original platform that they were intended for anymore as well. And then furthermore, I, arguably, the old virtual console offered on both Wii and Wii U is still superior to the modern Switch Online offering. Certainly. They obviously have DS and Wii games on on virtual console on the or they did on the wii u but of course you can't buy those anymore so the one outlet people had to buy a, a certain select few nintendo ds and wii games is now gone so what are you going to do you're going to turn to piracy because nobody no nobody normal uh wants to go out and collect every single console i'm i'm a bit of an outlier i will admit so one thing I will add, emulation has explicitly been held up as legal by the by U.S. courts, and this was, I believe, from the case of Bleem versus Sony ages ago. But Nintendo holds that emulation is harmful to developers itself. Whether or not you agree with that is a topic for another day. But <laughs> right, yeah. And this specific DCMA takedown is a little bit more complicated um, just due to the nature of what Nintendo was targeting. I believe that um, Nintendo's argument was that because Dolphin Emulator includes certain encryption keys that are used, that are necessary to run uh, certain Wii games, um, they were trying to argue that those encryption keys are copyrighted works by Nintendo, and so they can't be included inside the emulator's files. Even though they are present in every single Wii, um, it's sort of a uh, legally untested area in terms of whether or not uh, it would be really uh, in the spirit of the DCMA, and that you could actually copyright uh, encryption keys that were generated by your company, uh, but that remains to be seen in court. But obviously, the as Luke said, it's not clear-cut one way or the other, so any ruling in any direction could have far-reaching consequences on emulation, and as such, I don't suspect that this will go any further than just Dolphin leaving Steam, but it is something certainly to keep an eye on for the future. Certainly a setback for a lot of people who want to play some of the old games they did in their childhood, maybe don't have their hardware. Um, of course, we're not going to condone piracy on here. Um, and we want people to play games the best in, in the best possible settings, which may not be optimal 
with, say, a Nintendo 64. If you want to play your childhood games and you want to experience it the best way possible, honestly, a Nintendo 64 console may not be the best in terms of resolution, audio, video quality, um, etc. And so the lack of an ability to play those games you own in whatever manner you'd like, uh, of course, will hurt lots of people. Um, I'm going to leave the topic here, though, and we will move on to, uh, I guess, some miscellaneous other topics here. Yeah, so I'll just uh, get us started here. Um, I guess the first thing that we wanted to cover a little bit today, this isn't necessarily related to any immediately pressing gaming news, but uh, we were sort of talking about this earlier, and there have been a lot of uh, events, especially since 2020, that have been completely moved online and made into a sort of virtual experience. Um, and the the most uh, sort of gaming-related example of this is, of course, E3. Uh, E3 didn't just move online, they also, as I'm sure most viewers are aware, completely sort of had to shut things down this year because of most big studios uh, leaving E3 and working on their own presentations, uh, which is a very bold move by, I think, it's a very sensible move, but it's also a bold move in terms of the impacts that it'll have far-reaching past uh, past this year, past the next few years, uh, how gaming companies choose and when they choose to present their newest content. Uh, and of course, this goes outside of gaming. Companies like Apple, uh, especially in 2020, they were one of the first companies to really embrace the virtual showcase for their WWDC event. And I would say general consensus was that most people really enjoyed it. However, there are sort of some things you lose from having those um, in-person, live, unscripted, not unscripted, potentially unscripted events where things can happen that aren't supposed to happen. Absolutely. We have uh, plenty of examples of obviously embarrassing or outright terrible moments from E3's past, but that doesn't take and honestly kind of adds to the magic of that whole event. I think gamers or longtime gamers will remember, um, of course, the, the many E3s we had since... What, how long has it been, frankly? Has it been 1990-something? Um, <laughs> it's been a while. E3 has been a staple in the gaming community, and for good reason. On a commercial side, it really shows people what companies are up to. Leaving this up to the companies could be a dangerous move because this, this showcase really forced companies to come out and say, okay, we are paying attention to what you're what you're asking us for. And you know, in Nintendo's case, here's the newest Mario game. In Microsoft case, here's the newest Halo, the nearest uh, newest uh, Forza experience. And with Sony, there there are many third party and first party IPs. Um, I think in general, though, these. E3 in the past used to be very heavy on selling a product. It, it was, it was, and of course, even at its height, was still at one giant advertisement. But I think up until really the pandemic, developers did understand the excitement, the hype that went into E3. Seeing your favorite developer come on stage and talk about the, the series that you love and where they're going with it. Uh, and I think I think that's kind of been lost since the pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic made it so that we couldn't have anybody going in person. But I, I do worry that this will cause developers to be a little more out of touch. You know, online, you can say anything. So if someone drops Call of Duty Infinite Warfare trailer, everyone's going to tear it apart. Um, but the people who are coming to your E3 show, those are your those are your most hardcore fans. You're gonna you're gonna hear the most um, I guess the most loyal feedback from them. And even losing touch with your core audience, it might make 
I, I know that a lot of people have issues recently with games feeling soulless. I, I worry that this might make them even more so, if you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I think a recent example of that that ties perfectly into what you're saying is, uh, oh, man, I don't remember exactly what company it was. It might have been, mm, was it, was it Blizzard? The, they had some live event, and this was a few years ago. They announced some sort of mobile game that did not resonate at all with fans. And I think uh, the presenter on stage said something that was very, uh, very tactless. Uh, something like, don't you guys have phones? Completely missing the entire point of why all the fans were not excited about the game. And so these kind of online presentations are going to remove any sense of community and transparency between um, the people who are actually playing the games and the people developing the games. Absolutely. And without, of course, their other option would be to make, I don't know, something like surveys to fill out, and nobody nobody likes filling out surveys. So this was a fun way for gamers to connect with the, the developers of the games they loved most, and losing this does feel like a, a link is being severed between the gaming community. Yeah. In general, they're... Like, as they said, there are many, many drawbacks to the digital format. Obviously, for some companies like Nintendo with the Nintendo Direct format, it has definitely engaged fans and it works well in some ways and bad in others. But it would be nice to have a balance between the old style in-person events and the modern digital events rather than being all digital. All right. But well, aside let's... from that... I think we shall move on to the next item, which just, I believe it was yesterday, or maybe it was earlier today, I don't remember for certain, but Capcom recently announced that they are going to have their own showcase during the Summer Games Fest overall timing. So they didn't say any real specifics about like what to expect there or anything, but obviously, for Luke and myself, we're hoping to see a sequel to Ace Attorney. We were definitely in the minority there, but we very much like the game series. Absolutely. It's not very likely to see it in this showcase. Um, but of course, with the whole Capcom leak that happened around 2020, um, they did reveal that Ace Attorney 7 was uh, potentially in development. So it's possible that we could see a release around 2023 or 2024 if we're lucky, although the likelihood of seeing this at this event is pretty low. Aside from that, we're going to see the usual stuff around presumably Resident Evil and Monster Hunter. They are Capcom's two biggest franchises. They have a lot of fans. And I'm sure that both fan bases will be excited to see what's next, whether that be a new entry in the series, a remaster, etc. And speaking of Resident Evil, I saw on, at least in the last week or so, Capcom sent out a thing to some Resident Evil fans asking what games they should remake next. And given how well the Resident Evil 4 remake was received, it stands to reason that the new one will be good as well. I do I do think that in saying that Resident Evil and Monster Hunter were the two biggest franchises of Capcom's, you may have unleashed uh, <laughs> some, some angry fanboys. Uh, of course... They're also known for such titles as Mega Man. I don't think we're going to see anything Mega Man related. That's kind of a touchy subject since I guess modern Mega Man isn't seen very received very well by gamers. Of uh, The other one, of course, being Street Fighter, which I'm sure will make an appearance in some way or another. They'll find another way to remake Street Fighter 2. And I know that, uh, that 5 will be uh, if if it's not out already, it's on the way. I you do not six. six. There you go. You can tell I'm not a Street Fighter fan. <laughs> Which Street Fighter Six has introduced a lot of cool new features, especially to the series, and has also made it a little bit more friendly for beginners as well with a certain control method mode. So that's exciting as well. Although admittedly, no one present here plays that much Street Fighter. Sorry, if you're looking for a Street Fighter podcast, this is probably not the place to look. 
aside from that, maybe we might see some more about Exo Primal, which is a new upcoming Capcom IP that will launch day one on Game Pass. We don't know a lot about it, to be honest, but I have hopes that it'll be good. And obviously, there's a pretty decent chance of some random game series making a resurgence. Capcom has a treasure trove worth of old IPs that, like Nintendo, they don't always do that much with. Very true. Uh, although, we are seeing the re-release of Ghost Trick, which is a pretty sort of small one-hit game that they released on the DS a while ago. And now I believe it's coming to Steam, and I don't know if other platforms as well? I... Any ideas? The only thing I know of for certain is Steam, but don't take that as a fact. It's very well possible it might be coming to modern consoles, too. Anyway, though, that about wraps us up with Capcom. And while this next thing is not confirmed, traditionally speaking, Nintendo has often done a Direct during what would have been E3 season. So... We're going to give you just some thoughts about what we want to see from a hypothetical Nintendo Direct that has a good chance of happening, but once again is not confirmed to be happening yet. And Nintendo does have the tendency to just drop their Directs, you know, the next day after they announce them, so it could be, it could be any day this month. Um, however, I'm not sure what exactly Nintendo fans should expect at this point. I'm not sure if Nintendo is even planning anything, because Tears of the Kingdom, I guess, was their big release for this year. It's come out, and they're kind of just sitting on that. I'm getting constant ads for Tears of the Kingdom, and of course, the the barrage of articles surrounding it. You cannot escape it anywhere you go. Um, that being said, I think their next big projects, even on the Nintendo Switch, are limited. You have Metroid Prime 4. I know people have rumored that a new 2D Mario is in the works, but this, this to me, kind of felt like the swan song to, to the Nintendo Switch. You know, it, it started with, with Breath of the Wild, and here's this game that's that's so much bigger it's breath of the wild literally breath of the wild and so much more what can they really feasibly do on nintendo switch hardware going forward while still uh, still pleasing their long time and new fans i think i speak for everyone in the gaming community when we want to see a successor to the switch but realistically if that were to happen it would happen at their live event happening this september again talked about this last episode if you're looking to go you do need a nintendo account a nintendo network id um but as long as you have that you should sign up for that you get a you get a chance to win uh spots to go which is definitely a cool thing that nintendo is doing for fans and as john said there is a there is a decent there is also that chance that we don't see a direct because and an IGN report said something about this a little while ago, about how Tears of the Kingdom was like the only like major release that Nintendo had planned for this year, I believe. At least at a system seller level, because obviously there are still some other games coming out. But with that said, I would still kind of like to you know know what's next it'd be nice if we could like get any details at all about the switch successor or what games could hypothetically be on it with that said i don't think we will but that's just nintendo for you in terms of what i want to see on the new console i think i'll say what everybody has been thinking we all want a new 3d mario it's been a hot sec since odyssey and 3d mario is always are a lot of fun and have a lot of creativity and thought put into how they're made as well. I think you make a good point, although I do I would consider that as those are the top system sellers for Nintendo that the next 3D Mario would be on of course the new console and as much as I'd want to see all the specs for that if they were to announce it, I figure it would be much in the same light as Switch where they just show it off, say, look, it's coming. You know, good luck trying to figure out how powerful it is. We don't care. Yep. 
that is what Nintendo did for the Switch, and that is what I have a feeling they will do for the Switch too. But some other stuff that I would personally like to see. Obviously, I, I think we can all expect a Mario Kart on the system. You can't have a Nintendo system without it. And it's been a very, very long time since we've had a proper new entry in the series. Smash, Bro- ten years. Smash Bros. may or may not show up. If anything, it's more likely to be a port of Ultimate. Because I believe Sakurai said that this that, that was going to be... I, if not his last game, his last ga- Smash game at least. I do want to point out that he said that about Melee, Brawl, and Smash Four. <laughs> you can't, uh, you can't trust what Sakurai says because he, he wants control of his game. Because you know when he he makes it, he, he hits it right on the target, and uh, of course on on the topic of Mario Kart, uh, you can't. I, I wouldn't reasonably expect there to be a new entry with all the new courses coming out on Deluxe, still. Um, again, I have my my issues with the deluxe. You can see a whole video I made about that, but unfortunately, I I don't think a new Mario Kart is on the table for at least another year or two. To clarify, this is for games showing up on the Switch successor, not the Switch. Ah, I see. I thought we were talking about direct. <laughs> well, I I mostly agree with you that we're likely not going to see anything more major on the switch itself so this is more so for the future i got you oh well in that I, case I, I do want to hear what luke says before we move on yeah i mean obviously mario kart 9 would be very exciting to see um i think uh man i don't know it if i had to throw one out there that was just kind of probably not going to happen but i totally have to see it I think a new Chibi Robo game would be really fun, especially with all the things you can do on the Switch now. I could totally see that, and also give Chibi Robo a like proper chance to actually do well for once. Yeah, because there's quite the history with Chibi Robo games having some sort of handicap put on them that has resulted in underperformance. I don't think either uh, or any of us have brought it up, but both Pikmin 4 and Metroid Prime 4, of course, are both still on the table. Pikmin 4, I don't remember if that was supposed to be a 23 or 24 release, uh, but I, I do think that if it does come out, it will release on the Switch, if not on both the Switch and its potential successor. Um, I guess we'll have to see. Obviously, this is a, a bit of a confusing time for Nintendo fans. We don't know what's going to be on what, um, but we do know something is probably in the works, hopefully, as Nintendo seems to be losing a lot of their momentum they've had in the last couple of years. Especially with the increasing gaining momentum of the PS5, which has been much to the detriment of Xbox as well. I guess. Though, I, I do think it's entirely fair to say that Nintendo definitely... The traditional console war in that sense is firmly between Xbox and PlayStation. Nintendo is firmly sailing their own ship. Oh, certainly. And it seems like Xbox is trying to do the same, but you really can't uh, <laughs> really can't not compare the three, given they all have been historical rivals to each other. Um, and I guess going back into history, I believe we wanted to cover, um, going forward, at least one major console highlight per month just talking about i uh, i guess the games what it did for the industry and maybe some game recommendations that you can find either on the original console or uh, ported to a different a different device that much is true we at as of next episode we'll be discussing the nintendo 64 to get us started that should be a good one because we have let's just say some differing opinions on various aspects various aspects of the nintendo 64 i think that's a fair way to put it wouldn't you guys say oh I, I definitely think broad range <laughs> right on point there so with that said that about wraps up the wraps up the news for today does anybody have a recommended game that they want to share at the end here 
Well, frankly, I've just been playing uh, Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> it's been... Uh... You heard the man. The recommended game for this week is The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> Near an hour 50 there, and uh, I have uh, friends who have hit hour 150. So, you know that you are getting what you pay for. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very it was very fun when I played it as well. The new mechanics offer a lot more in terms of like creativity, especially. We'll but... try and have something a little more niche. And I'm uh, sorry, unless Luke, I know we haven't given you a chance to talk. Do you have anything <laughs> anything you can recommend at all? <laughs> oh, man. Um Okay, this one's gonna be kinda out there, but uh I would say Super Monkey Ball for the Game Boy Advance. It was a very interesting game. All right. Definitely uh, kind of surreal to see it actually running on the Game Boy Advance. And it was kind of enjoyable. All right, Fern. That was certainly not quite what I was expecting you to say, but... There you go. So, that... question then. Is it only on Game Boy Advance, or is it now, uh, now on well, other platforms? I believe the Game Boy Advance version uh, is, I mean, the levels are very, uh, very surface level in terms of, like, the sort of scenery and all the platforms, so I don't think there's really much merit to pouring it to better systems, uh, but for the 3D capabilities that the GBA had, uh, it was pretty impressive. Is this, by any chance, Super Monkey Ball Jr.? Uh, is that it? I'd have to double check. You know what? That's it. It might be it too. Like <laughs> Super Monkey Ball GBA, but uh, that seems to be the okay. One it from... was. It was. It was. In that case, so... it's an arcade game, and interesting. Uh, is it? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's at least on the end gauge. All right. Well, go get out your end gauges, guys, <laughs> and uh. Go play Super Monkey Ball Jr. <laughs> With that very out there suggestion from Luke, though, I think that about wraps us up for today, unless either of you have anything else to add. Um, I don't think nope. I do. All right. In that case, thank you all for watching, as always. You'll find the links to our channels in the description. This should go live, hopefully relatively soon, on the Duck of the Stars channel, and as always... See you in the next one.